I have sort of three more topics. And I'm going to start on the first of them today. And um, the title I give this is, is, is paradoxical, but it's called Giving Someone Freedom. And that's meant to describe an end of the work, as a goal of the work. <coughs> and, um, and so this talk, this talking today, hi, this talking today, and maybe next time too, I don't know, um, will direct, it, direct itself at the goals of psychiatric work. Now, the reason I do this is that the ends of the goals of psychiatric work are just as disputed and conflicted as are the means we've been talking about the method. And, um, and this, of course, presents very serious problems to us because, um, and it, it springs in part from the fact that, of course, each of the schools gives an account of psychopathology, and by extension, that's also an account of health, and therefore ideals. And so I think we have to come to some terms with, with the the goals of the schools and an attempt, as I'm going to try to do very ambitiously, to formulate a viable set of uh, psychiatric ideas. And I'll start on that effort, that's it today. Um, and this, is, this is by no means, in my opinion, a trivial or academic matter because the, the goals of the work inevitably shape it from the beginning. That is, we do not offer ourselves, for the most part, in my, in my experience, as simple guides or making gentle suggestions. But these goals impinge on the whole work right from the start. So as I say, this doesn't seem to me a trivial matter. Um, and another way of saying that is, if, if we don't mean to... And, and of course, many patients don't object to that. That is, they attend psychotherapy the way they might attend church. Uh, in order to find out a plan for their lives and receive instruction and ideals. Uh, so that the covert uh, ideals that are smuggled into the work are welcome. But it seems to me that that's uh, counterproductive to the, to the genuine medical interest. Uh, so if we, if we, in other words, if we mean to, uh, to have a psychotherapy which is neither religious nor legal in its basic impact, but instead consists of, of, of methods to assist people to find their own way, if you like. Then we have to confront the ideals of the school and see to what extent they constitute viable ideals and to what extent we can find our way among them. Now, the fact that there are many ideals that are presented by the psychotherapies and the psychiatric schools is, of course, the patient's one freedom as the fact that you can pick the kind of thing you want and in this sectarian situation we work in, is the, is the patient's principal free, just ignore it please, is the, unless you have an emergency, um, uh, uh, is the patient's principal freedom? That we all know that's the case, that if you go to this one or that one, you'll get this or that. And people are known, of course, as Jungian or Freudian or Hagaristic or whatever the, uh, the school affiliations are. And so you, you see there's something paradoxical in what I'm suggesting, and that is that, that if we are going to make inroads on the um, on sectarianism, at this, if insofar as we succeed in doing that, insofar as we succeed in making inroads on sectarianism, we then will diminish the patient's freedom. So we have to be very careful where we come out, if we do come out anywhere of interest, in this search for ideals. Now I'm going to I'm going to attempt something in the, in the next two sections of these talks. I'm going to attempt something somewhat parallel, not about I uh, will leave the subject to the ends of treatment, and I'll deal with the evaluation of psychiatric data. And as many of you have heard me say already, I will argue that that, that, that tenacious but difficult problem of judging what the significance of psychiatric data is has been handled by making very simplifying assumptions. For example, that, that the important data is intrapsychic, or the important data is biological, or the important data is social, whatever the school assumption. But if we throw aside those simplifying assumptions, 
we have to find some other way by which we can establish the reliability or the significance of our data. And that's a very tenacious problem. But it, you see how it relates to my problem of the ideals. If we throw aside the, the sectarian ideals, what are we going to put in their place? And then I'm going to finish up, I think I'll finish up talking about presenting some what I think are, are, are difficult clinical situations. Those that defy, I think, most of the established methods. And then we'll try to put the tools that I've been developing here and discussing in here, uh, put the tools to work on those particularly difficult situations to see what, uh, what one can do when one exercises them on those situations. And that, in turn, is like this problem. If we, if we put aside um, the traditional ways, some of the traditional ways we work, or exclusive dependence on some of the ways we work, can we satisfy ourselves that we have something, something larger, more inclusive than we offer? Well, <clears throat> the, the first subject I want to talk about under the heading of this, of this, um, giving someone freedom is, is objective descriptive psychiatry. I'm going to talk about the, the goals of objective descriptive psychiatry. And, um, the, uh, or, what, or what I might call a disease school. And I think that's, you know, it's particularly, I think it's a particularly important thing to discuss at this time when DSM-3 has been widely touted as a way of dealing with our problems. And is and, and has many very great assets of it. Now we, I don't need to remind you that the objective descriptor of disease school seeks symptoms and signs, doesn't it? And the collection of these into syndromes and hopefully disease states. And health health in this approach is the absence of these disease states or predominance of what's called negative findings. In different words, there are no symptoms of health. Freedom and health are freedom from disease. Now, the disease concept, as it was developed by Kreplin, anyway, less dogmatically by Kalbaum, but the disease concept, as it's come down to us, and as it's still pretty much used, rests on some unity among cause, etiology, clinical picture, symptomatology, course and outcome. But there is some unity among those. That's the basis of the disease concept. In, in other words, insofar as psychiatric diseases exist, and some feel they don't, of course, but insofar as psychiatric diseases exist, one finds predictable relationships among the cause of the psychological picture, the picture that results, and at least some tendency to a particular course and outcome. Now, the concept of psychiatric diseases is threatened whenever many causes produce the same psychological picture or the same, co or the same causes different psychological pictures or the same picture has many different courses and outcomes. Those, uh, those results are all profoundly threatened to the disease conception. Now, I think it's important to emphasize that no quantitative measures exist to determine how much relationship among cause, picture, course, and outcome is necessary in order to establish this disease state. In other words, there's no light that goes on that when you get a certain amount of relationship among those things, it announces it's a disease. This is very much an impression, as we said, clinical impression. Now, this, the same thing can be said about the relationship between these factors, uh, that is, cause, picture, course, and outcome, and such other factors as incidence, epidemiology, treatment, knowledge of which enters disease designations as soon as the designations are fairly well established. Now, because of the very low levels of predictability among the disease factors, I mean, especially low, for example, between cause, almost always only suspected in psychiatry, hmm? and anything else of those factors. But because the very low levels of predictability among those disease factors, 
We, as a rule, talk about syndromes or disease entities. Weasel word, disease entities, rather than disease. All this is by way of saying is that the foundations for the disease concept are very shaky. Very shaky indeed. That doesn't mean that it isn't a, mag a magnificent hypothesis, but that the foundations of it are very shaky indeed. Now, there's an historical way of asserting this that <coughs> may be of more interest, although it's all perhaps rather obvious. And <coughs> that is that Emil Kreplin, who was certainly the, the man who, more than anybody else, sold the disease concept to survive. This victory of Kreplin's was very narrowly and incompletely won. I mean, I, some, it surprises me sometimes to read the accounts of the psychiatric diseases and see how that is, is over and over again forgotten. Although he himself knew that, that uh, he had done no more than, than made a valiant attempt. Read sometime his historical, his autobiographical review of Sakai, the hundred years of Sakai, and you'll see that has a much broader view than, as usual, than most of his, uh, most of his acolytes would have. Anyway, this, this victory of the disease school was, was very incompletely and narrowly won. And, and I think that there are three ways in which you can demonstrate that very starkly. The most dramatic, perhaps, is that within four or five years of the new century, the, the disease concept gets its, its most powerful statement at Kreplin's hands by 1895, 96, in the 5th and 6th uh, editions of his textbook. And, and, but already, by four or five years into the 20th century, one of his major contentions has been pretty much destroyed. That is his contention that there was a clinical picture to correspond with each causal agent. That was perhaps his fondest hope. He never gave it up even though he went on until 1927. But it, was, it really had been, his, to a very considerable extent, that boat had been shot right out of the water and by one of his rivals, Bonhoeffer, at the University of Berlin. And what Bonhoeffer, and also what Wernicke showed, was that in the febrile psychoses, the broad range of the febrile psychoses, and also the toxic psychoses, there was no correspondence between the causal agent, the toxin, or the, feb the type of febrile psychosis, and the clinical delirium as that result. That these were only predictable, if they were predictable at all, from an account of the character structure of the patient. Now, he's not talking about so-called non-organic psychosis, although Freud although Kreplin thought that pretty much were all organic. He's talking about well-demarcated toxic and febrile conditions. There, I mean, where you might expect the influence of the somatic factor to be most dominant, the clinical picture of the deliria, for example, did not bear any relate, predictable relationship to the cause of the deliria. And you see what a fundamental discovery that is. And it's never been disputed. It's been repeated, by the way. It was repeated in America literature by Wolf, and the man who did the end of things, Wolf and Wolf and the gastric system. And uh, to my knowledge, it's never been, never been uh, disputed. Uh, so that you see how that strikes at the very vitals of the disease conception. If you can't see, if you can't establish a, a significant relationship between cause and clinical picture, Think of what that would do to the concept of measles, for example, if you think of, you think of a well-demarcated uh, uh, well, well disease state. What would it be like if there was simply no way you could get an account of measles from the, from the particular viral infection? That's what, we, that's what this discovery amounts to. And that was the first of his rather rocking uh, events. The other two are not so dramatic, but they're interesting. There were two, as I understand it, there were two uh, principal enemies that Kreplin had to defeat in his intellectual warfare to, uh, to uh, produce some to produce some kind of uh, success for his disease concept in the world. The first of these was the so-called psychological theory, the, I mean, the psychological nosology. See, the, I mean, his school is called the objective descriptive school, but he himself would have objected very heavily to, to being called a descriptive psychiatrist. In fact, Kreplin thought he was rescuing psychiatry from a descriptive school. 
And indeed, to some extent, he did. And putting it on a medical basis, in which it rests not simply on the description of the disease, but on cause, outcome, treatment method, all the things I mentioned, and others. Because the descriptive school was one of the two principal ones with which he had to contend. And Bonhoeffer's predecessor at the University of Berlin, which is like being the professor at Harvard, only much more important, because they only had one professor in the university, as they used to at Harvard. But anyway, the, his predecessor, Bonhoeffer's predecessor, was Zian, and Zian was the, was the foremost exponent of the, of the psychological descriptive school. And what that meant was that every psychological entity was described and classified according to the principal psychological function affected. That's whether one's motor phenomena were affected, one's affect, one's thinking, one's perceiving, whatever. That's one of the reasons that schizophrenia was divided into paranoid, catatonic, simple, and evil kind, because those correspond to <coughs> ideas, movements, affects, and everything. And that was the way everything was described. And you had long lists in which subsidiary symptoms of a secondary kind were mentioned, but that an illness was supposed to be defined by the primary uh, mental system effect, mental function affected. The, um, you, you can see, you can imagine some of the historical forerunners of that, and you can imagine why such a psychological idea would ever have gotten into medicine if you can remember, you know, the phrenological influence on medicine through the 19th century. And because they really did feel that it might be possible to localize psychological function in terms of various neural bumps, or at least gyri, of the brain. And that therefore there would be a sort of coming together of psychological and neurological function. But that hasn't worked out very well. Some success, but that hasn't worked out very well. But that was the predominant, David, was the predominant... Uh, one of the predominant views that Crepton had to contest with. There was an ancient idea that was somewhat similar in the description of character structure and of the etiology of diseases in the same set of humors. Mm -hmm. you, would be, you would have a disease of the phlegm or be a phlegmatic person and you'd be a bilious or choleric and so on sort of person. But your, the etiology and character of diseases would also be described in terms of the particular humors that were yeah. affected, right. That's a very good analogy. Yeah. Sometimes pick up uh, pick up Burton's anatomy and melancholy and see what changes can be run on some of those ideas. Um you're studying with some historical context as well as the descriptive school, but in fact the Kreppman science of the psychiatry and moved it out of the descriptive right. school and into really a more medical, medical model. Yeah, right. That's exactly what he thought he was doing. And uh, indeed he was. But that was one. Now the reason that I say that he didn't defeat that idea was that, he, and I like <coughs> mentioned this before, that ironically enough, in what many consider to be his greatest achievement, the delineation of manic depressive psychosis and schizophrenia, that idea still remains at, in, at, at work because we speak of them as being respectively affect and thinking disorder, right in keeping with the old psychological function delineation. Um, now, the other principle diagnostic idea with which he had to contend. Um, and I don't think he ever was sure he defeated the psychological one. He just didn't think it was medically useful. Uh, but he did think he had defeated his other enemy. And there's a triumphant passage in his autobiographical remarks which explains why he thought he had defeated him. I'll give it to you and then you see whether you agree with him. Anyway, the, the other idea uh, which was had the principal prestige throughout the 19th century. Throughout the 19th century, many very uh, uh, distinguished figures subscribed to it, as they still do. Uh, was the so-called Visenya or Anhite Psychosa idea, and that was the idea that there were not many mental illnesses. In fact, there was only one mental illness, and everything you saw clinically simply depended upon what stage of that mental illness you caught the patient at. That's the Visenya or Einheit Psychosa view. And in one of the most famous formulations, or the best known formulation of it, 
Newmont. The contention was made that, that when you go bananas, you go this way. You first become <coughs> anxious or nervous, then you become neurasthenic, then you get depressed, then you get elated, then you get deluded, and then you get demented if you go all the way down. And when you get better, you come back up the same rocky path. Now, Kreplin never doubted that many of the cases beautifully illustrate that fact. And in fact, you can take his case material, for example, in his Einfühlung, his introduction to clinical psychiatry, you can take him and you can see that progression, because he described it very carefully. But he insisted that all the cases did not. Now, Kaubaum, who was a cannier number than Kreplin, in my opinion, always thought that that should, should make him say that maybe some of the cases do correspond to the disease concept and some correspond to the Vesania concept. But Kreplin, like all these enormously powerful political figures, wanted a single explanation. So he stuck with the idea that the fact that some cases did not correspond to the same idea was enough to defeat the whole of the same idea. <clears throat> now, the, the cases that he thought proved that this was not an inclusive account of mental illness were the simple schizophrenic cases, which he thought plunged immediately into certain of their symptoms without going through this course. It will amuse you, and I hope you will make use of it too. It will amuse you to know that he never, Kreplin never tired of pointing out how many people on their way to dementia, precocious schizophrenia, went through manic and depressive periods. That was routine. So for those of you who think that you're going to make sharp differentiations along that line, good luck. And whether, of course, you, you use the device that was, ex as a matter of fact, coined more or less in this room, not by me or my predecessor, but by somebody else back in the 20s, uh, the concept of schizoaffective psychosis is what I've called a terminological suture for that problem, whether you do that, or keep in mind this the same concept. That's up, apparently still up, to, up for grabs. Anyway, that was a very powerful 19th century idea. And, uh, and you can see why it was some of the sources of its power, because it continues. And your director of training in this very institution, to this day, is one of the principal living exponents of the Vesania concept. That is, in psychoanalysis, were the inheritors of the Vesania, were the inheritors of the Vesania concept. Because you remember, in psychoanalysis, diseases are seen developmentally. That is, the, in each of the principal diseases, Freud attempted to locate on a developmental point. You know, hysteria is a reflection of Oedipal conflict. Uh, obsessional diseases are anal in origin. Schizophrenia is early oral in origin. Blah, 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 down the line. So here is the modern form of the Vesemia. And how sick you get depends upon the level of your regression or fixation. How far down that path you have to travel. The... Um, now, if this, the, the psychoanalytic form of the Vesania has taken two forms. One has been to, to talk about, um, to talk about the uh, uh, libidinal fixations and conflicts. The more modern form is the eco-psychological form, which George represents, George Lane represents, in which the levels are, are marked by the ego defense devices, most prominent. So if you fall all the way back into the schizophrenic soup or something, you find yourself dominated by projection, denial, and distortion, etc., and depends on how you go back on that line. So, in other words, the Vesania idea is by no means dead. It's very much alive. In fact, I gather if you go to Toronto in May 18th, whenever it is, on a Wednesday, you can hear a debate between, um, on the one hand, George Valiant, the same name man, plus Robert Michaels, another esteemed and brilliant man from Cornell, versus none other than, uh, than the innovator, the, than the propagator, that the new Kreplinian propagator of DSM-3, Robert Spitzer, who in turn has been, is being, I uh, backed up, I think you better watch out, he may find himself on the cut, but <laughs> backed up supposedly by another alumnus of this estimable institution, Gerald Clareman. And that, uh, I'm told, I haven't seen the program, but I'm told that Wednesday morning in Toronto, you can hear under the sponsorship of our neighbor, John DeMaia, under the moderation, if you can moderate this one, uh, uh, you can hear George and Bob Michaels contesting against Spitzer and Clareman 
over the issue of whether DSM-3, the disease school, disease concept is viable or not. So you see this goes on and on and on. Well, <clears throat> and I'm sure it will go on beyond Wednesday, May 18th, whenever I notice. Well, I, I make these points because you remember my starting statement was that, that Kreplin's victory for his disease concept was very narrowly incompletely won. And I think those three points, the, the, uh, the, the lack of connection between causal agents and disease picture, the, the continuing presence of some of the psychological function ideas, and finally, perhaps most impressively, the continuation of the Vesania concept of disease right alongside of the, of the disease school all speak to those um, the restrictions on the credibility of the, of the disease concept. You may have mentioned this earlier, but what's the origin of Vesania? Vesania has a number of different meanings. It, I think, I'm not, I don't know as much about that as I should. It's, uh, it, it's often used to mean insanity, Vesania insanity. There are some other terms that are involved in that, and I can't speak to them. Is this a German word? I don't know what its origin is. It doesn't sound like it's a German word. The German word has generally been Einheit psychosa, which means one of psychosis. I imagine it's a Latin word. <clears throat> At the same time, there's a great deal to be said for a developmental model. By no means foolish. God knows it's a powerful idea. And so I think we can work. You know, you know my interest in sectarianism and trying to find a way through it. And I've shifted now from the methods to the, to the from means to ends, you might say, at this, at this point in this case. I also, of course, am very interested because the ends affect the means. That is, the, the kind of picture you have in mind, the way you work with people, is enormously affected by your sort of presuppositions about where they should be. That is obvious, isn't it? I can I... You, know, you who are not in treatment with your teachers, you know, ostensibly, uh, nevertheless feel a terrific pressure to conform to certain kinds of, uh, of behaviors on the basis of this embryological metaphor. And, uh, there are things you must not show. I mean, take up, for example, the, the different disease categories and think of which makes you more nervous and which makes you less nervous. I mean, most people are, are rather pleased with the idea of being hysterical. They really are. And why? Because that constitutes the most adult form of pathology. By in this scheme, whether it truly is or not, is a very questionable matter. Unfortunately, our system is so flexible because we have primitive hysteria, oral hysteria, so we can always shuffle it around. But the fact is, it makes us very much better. And you know, if, you, if your supervisor suggests that something you do is hysterical, that's better than it was obsessional. And why? Because the anal precedes the edible in this great chain of being. And, they, and oh, that you should be found out to be seriously paranoid and therefore to be pre-anal and a little post something else. Is, is need not, I need not remind you how, how, how we have all trembled at the possibility that these dark things might be within us. Mm -hmm. I wonder, I'm going to contend also that, and I'm, I'm trying to tweak George's beard a little bit in some of this. I'm going to suggest that, that there are places when denial and projection are absolutely necessary for human health. I'm going to spell it out a little bit. They constitute some of the most useful devices that we have. Again, I'm contending that, that, that the ego, ego de defense system isn't going to work for us very well either. Even though, again, it, 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 has a certain, it does a certain service. You said projection in denial or denial? This distortion. Well, I meant I'm, I'm particularly sold on the value of projection and denial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, the capacity to project yourself into something, for example, is one of the most foremost traits of, of grown-up human beings. That capacity to project. Very close. Very close. Read the literature on projective identification, which is so close to empathy. You see the terrible ambiguities that run through that idea as to whether it's good or bad enough. And the patient should be able to do it. The therapist should be able to do it, but the patient shouldn't. There's a funny kind of thing that goes on there. And as for denial, I mean, that's, that's I think, one of the larger jokes that's kind of played on us because it's uh, what you would do without that. 
Right. Simply, it, it may under underpin the whole concept of psychic health. Mm-hmm. Look at it, right? Mm-hmm. So when you get depressed. Well, you just overwhelm. Find find someone like Luria's famous case of the, yeah. of the man who was sens- sensorium was constantly flooded by memories and everything. Otherwise, had no capacity for denial at all. Utterly, utterly incapacitated. He didn't do anything. But that could be hard to sort out because you know what the response will be. Well, massive denial is bad, or denial of some things is bad. Well, that's true. So, but how do we exactly. decide which ones and how much? It's actually couched in the negative as somebody's ability to concentrate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It's not talking about their ability to deny. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a nice focus on the health and sickness side of it. So what I'll be looking for, and I have some suggestions to offer you, is some criteria of health that would be that would be a little bit less seem a little less arbitrary, and particularly criteria of health that would serve our purpose, and my purpose, which is to speak of health in psychotherapy. And I've talked lots of other places you can talk about. Try that next week. Try that next week.